Effective learning is a lifelong skill, critical for personal growth, excelling in exams, and so much more. The principles I will talk about today will be tailored towards the STEM field and exams, however they will be placed in the bigger picture of lifelong learning. If you're able to capture the essence of the principles, each of which builds on the previous, I can assure you, you'll see your performance elevate to a new level, whether it be in exams, lifelong learning, and beyond. Whilst I acknowledge some good fortune, but not without periods of hardship too, these are the same principles that I used to rank first in my Cambridge Chemical Engineering cohort, achieve a top-ranked final year dissertation, and similarly outside of academia too. I have also passed these principles on in over 1,100 hours spent teaching, mentoring, and inspiring hundreds of students from a variety of backgrounds, elevating performance by two grades on average and transforming mindsets along the way. My goal in sharing these principles with you is simple. It is to give you the confidence to bring out your true learning potential and to take your mindset to places where you might not have gotten by yourself. Principle number one, the universal learning process. Before starting, you have to be open to new ideas, overcoming challenges, and importantly, not being afraid of being wrong a lot. Are you afraid that people might judge you? Well, no one actually cares really anywhere near as much as you think. Last time you saw someone make a mistake, how much did you truly care? Whilst everyone learns in slightly different ways, from my experiences, a three-step framework is necessary for truly learning a craft or skill. Understanding, application, and consolidation. The details within each may differ depending on the skill being learned and the learner, but the framework remains the same. To know something is to have a surface level awareness of a concept. You're able to recognize it and associate with it. To understand something is to be able to derive said concept from elementary principles to grasp where it fits into a broader knowledge picture. And to be able to explain things very simply, even under interrogative digging of someone asking you, what is this? Why does this work? How is this the case? Teaching others is a great way to assess this, as you'll be asked probing questions that you'd never thought of before. Get in the habit of questioning your own understanding. An influential study from 2002 showed people tend to think they understand a concept better than they actually do, especially at the start of learning. In time though, if you stagnate or don't critically appraise and grow your understanding, you can find yourself in a similar predicament. A solid understanding minimizes the amount you need to memorize. Brute force memorization should always be the last resort if understanding or simple logic don't first suffice. Whenever you start rote learning singular pieces of information in a vacuum without any consideration for how they link together to the bigger picture, always time to stop, pause, and reflect if this is the best approach you should be taking. You then need to gain experience in applying this understanding learning patterns and relevant problem solving along the way. For exams, past papers are excellent for this. For STEM, doing the first few with the aid of a mark scheme so that you aren't blankly staring at a question for hours on end can be very useful. And then as you get better, you gradually remove that help. And the final few papers I'd recommend doing as a mock exam. And finally, consolidation. Updating your understanding in light of your new experiences and reflecting on any mistakes. For lifelong learning, you'll find yourself looping through this process many times. For exam revision, I frequently see students trying to learn solely by applying and doing questions. And I tend to find students who do this forget everything rather rapidly within a matter of weeks if not days after their exam. Learning only by applying can lead to a scattergun approach, and there is a risk that you never actually organise your mental toolbox. And trying to continually solve problems from a jumbled set of tools generally results in a lot of things being forgotten. Whilst application is a great way to learn, it should not be the only thing you do. Principle 2. A first principles approach. Whether you're studying, trying to learn a new topic, or starting a project, it can be tempting to delve straight into the details. However, let's take a step back. Scope what you're trying to do, assemble everything you need, and then reorder things into a first principles pyramid structured in a way that makes sense to you. This becomes the center from which you structure further learning and how you incorporate new knowledge and perspectives into your thoughts. 
Let's say you're learning about differential equations in maths. Well, let's write down everything you can think of needing to know into a list of tens of items long, restructure things into your pyramid, and then construct your notes and understanding from there, explaining each concept from the ground up in your own words. This won't usually be in the structure of your textbook or class notes and so on, and should be incredibly mentally straining and push the limits of your understanding. Do not just summarize the content in the order of your textbook, lecture notes, or whatever you're learning from. This takes a while and is largely a waste of time, partly because it doesn't give you any long-term retention of the structure, the big picture structure on what you are learning. As you progress, spend a disproportionate amount of time on your weak spots in your fundamentals before you start ascending in complexity. Typically in life, you're told to focus on your strengths. However, this is different. Here you're forging an essential fundamental base to become great at your craft. It helps to have a system for how you make your learning resources, subtitles, colours, bullet points and so on for specific bits of information. Whatever you do in all of this, there is wondrous elegance in simplicity. Simple frameworks are more powerful to internalise and build from. For debunking difficult problems or projects, viewing them from different levels of depth can be helpful, starting first with the fundamental base to generate possible solutions and answers, then venturing up to the next level of complexity, and so on and so forth. Without a solid fundamental base, the lens of your problem solving rests on volatile ground. Principle 3. Active learning loops. Looping through the contents you need to learn as many times as you can, using techniques that require you to actively engage with the material rather than passively receive information and being told something. Active recall and structured blurting, repeated frequently and consistently to overcome the forgetting curve, alongside look, cover, check and mnemonics are the main techniques I used and still use in my learning. However, lean in to techniques that work best for you. These are tried and tested techniques with a wealth of studies proving their effectiveness. I urge you not to rely heavily on a technique that makes you feel good, makes you feel like you're making progress, but in reality accomplishes very little. Rereading, mindless summarization, highlighting, consuming content without assimilation and reflection, for example. There are a lot of pre-written resources on the internet for certain topics. By all means, use these to guide you. However, don't fall for the trap of rereading them and using them as an excuse not to write your own learning material. Length of time doing something does not necessarily translate to end competence. Principle four, internalizing neural connections. When we learn something, we're creating a connection between neurons in our brain that houses that skill. After that, we want to continuously use that skill to strengthen it through myelination of the neural connection. Myelination is a process where lipids wrap around your neural connections, massively increasing processing speed for these skills. Active learning techniques that require you to repeatedly and consistently stretch your thought processes in a mentally taxing way are imperative for fostering connections. Principle five, understanding your flow state. I am sure everyone has felt at some point that state of mind where you are completely immersed in what you're doing and your productivity 5x's according to studies. Unfortunately, flow is not something we easily slip into. You might want to position a set of short tasks like a 10 minute review of the previous day and 10 minutes to set your goals for the day ahead to ease in and build up momentum. Without this momentum, starting a session off, even with the task of slightest difficulty, it can be too easy to procrastinate. What is your chronotype? When do you work best? Identify your flow blockers and make your environment resistant to them. Are you distracted by scrolling on your phone? Well, recognize when you are and then set yourself a limit of quickly viewing five further posts and then firmly say stop and turn your phone off. Once you're in flow, keep working until you lose momentum. Whether this results in 30 minutes or six hours of continuous non-stop work, the exact time is irrelevant. Importantly though, don't assess the success of your session by the amount of hours that you've worked, but rather the tasks you get done, the concepts you've understood, the skills you learned. These are the things that propel and move you forward. It is much preferable to work smarter than harder. 
However, that being said, you will unlock your true learning potential by working both smart and hard. The two are not independent. Principle six, engineered compression. Aiding with flow state, studies have shown we generally work best with a balanced measure of adrenaline or eustress. I frequently combine the concepts of work compression with Parkinson's law. Parkinson's law states that a task will expand to fill the time allotted for its completion. And work compression is about faster completion without compromise to quality. I would take an educated guess on the length of a task, time block it in my schedule, and then reduce that time frame by about 20 to 30 percent. I found this to be optimal for me. Please do experiment for yourself though. You don't want to push things too much to the point where any excess stress created becomes detrimental. You'll need to be selective about what you do and what you learn from. Reflect from an extended learning session you had, isolating actions and learning results that gave you 80% of the results for 20% of the effort. This is all especially useful if you are in a time pinch. Principle seven, the importance of sleep. Rapid eye movement or REM sleep and deep sleep make up key components of our sleep cycle, with the latter dominating the initial bulk and REM in the final quarters. Deep sleep takes the day's learnings and reinforces them, strengthening neural connections. Connections not used frequently or intensely, like in active learning, are eliminated. In REM sleep, there is increased activity in brain regions associated with thinking and creativity, subconsciously facilitating innovative connections between your learned ideas. Hence, if you're stuck on understanding a concept or solving a problem, sleeping on it and coming back to it the following day isn't half bad advice. Similar importance of sleep can be placed on hydration, good diet and exercise as well. Principle eight, and this is perhaps the most important, mindset framing. If done correctly, all things concerning motivation, discipline and so on will take care of themselves. Grades, reward systems, materialistic goals, whilst important for many reasons, can consume and manipulate your thoughts if you're not careful, distracting you from the actions you really should be taking. I'm not saying these things aren't important. Every student and learner faces their own unique set of challenges, whether it be personal pressures, systemic inequalities, short-term needs, and things they need to obtain to keep moving forward. But placing grades, rewards, and materialistic goals too close to the forefront of what drives you can actually have the opposite effect of pushing them away. Focusing on autotelicity and intrinsic drivers that align with your long-term goals and aspirations, your learning and development are primary. And your grades or anything materialistic will come as a consequence of doing these primary things well. For exams, a grade or boundary should never be the target you aim for. Focusing on getting the highest mark you can get should be your aim. To achieve your potential, and the grade will take care of itself. To forge your true goals, take some time thinking where you want to be in, say, five years' time, and use this as your compass. Place everything you're doing in the context of taking small steps day by day to what you want to become recognizing that your time is your most valuable resource. Don't waste time on things that are not worthy of your time and try to channel it towards making your primary goals a reality. And that concludes today's video. Thank you for listening to the end. And just remember, action cures ignorance. If you are not prepared to change your ways, your actions and your mindset, don't expect your results to change either. Stay curious, be inspired, and keep growing. See you next time.